Chapter 3 of Book 10 of Les Miserables, Volume 4 by Victor Hugo. Les Miserables, Volume 4 by Victor Hugo, translated by Elizabeth Florence Hapgood, Book 10, the 5th of June, 1832. Chapter 3 A Burial An Occasion to Be Born Again. In the spring of 1832, Although the cholera had been chilling all minds for the last three months, and had cast over their agitation an indescribable and gloomy pacification, Paris had already long been ripe for commotion. As we have said, the great city resembles a piece of artillery. When it is loaded, it suffices for a spark to fall, and the shot is discharged. In June 1832, the spark was the death of General Lamarque. Lamarque was a man of renown and of action. He had had in succession under the Empire and under the Restoration the sorts of bravery requisite for the two epochs, the bravery of the battlefield and the bravery of the tribune. He was as eloquent as he had been valiant. A sword was discernible in his speech. Like Foy, his predecessor, after upholding the command, he upheld liberty. He sat between the left and the extreme left, beloved of the people, because he accepted the chances of the future, beloved of the populace, because he had served the emperor well. He was, in company with Comte Girard and Rouet, one of Napoleon's marshals in Peto. The treaties of 1815 removed him as a personal offense. He hated Wellington with a downright hatred which pleased the multitude, and for seventeen years he majestically preserved the sadness of Waterloo, paying hardly any attention to intervening events. In his death agony at his last hour, he clasped to his breast a sword which had been presented to him by the officers of the Hundred Days. Napoleon had died uttering the word army, Lamarck uttering the word country. His death, which was expected, was dreaded by the people as a loss, and by the government as an occasion. This death was an affliction. Like everything that is bitter, affliction may turn to revolt. This is what took place. On the preceding evening, and on the morning of the 5th of June, the day appointed for Lamarck's burial, the Faubert Saint Antoine, which the procession was to touch at, assumed a formidable aspect. This tumultuous network of streets was filled with rumors. They armed themselves as best they might. Joiners carried off door weights of their establishments to break down doors. One of them had made himself a dagger of a stocking weaver's hook by breaking off the hook and sharpening the stump. Another, who was in a fever to attack, slept wholly dressed for three days. A carpenter named Lombier met a comrade who asked him, "'Whither are you going?' "'Eh? Well, I have no weapons.' "'What, then?' "'I'm going to my timber yard to get my compasses.' "'What for?' "'I don't know,' said Lombier. A certain Jacqueline, an expeditious man, accosted some passing artisans. "'Come here, you!' He treated them to ten sous' worth of wine, and said, "'Have you work?' "'No.' "'Go to Fee Pierre, between the Barrière Charon and the Barrière Montreal, and you will find work.' At Fee Pierre's they found cartridges and arms." Certain well-known leaders were going the rounds, that is to say, running from one house to another to collect their men. At Barthelmy's near the Barrier de Tron, at Capelle's near the Petit Chapeau, the drinkers accosted each other with a grave air. They were heard to say, "'Have you your pistol?' "'Under my blouse. And you?' "'Under my shirt.' In the Rue Traversière, in front of the Bland Workshop, and in the yard of the Maison Brûlée, in front of toolmakers' Berniers, groups whispered together. Among them was observed a certain Mavot, 
who never remained more than a week in one shop, as the masters always discharged him, because they were obliged to dispute with him every day. Mavot was killed the following day, at the barricade of the Rue Menilmontant. Pritot, who was destined to perish also in the struggle, and to the question, What is your object? he replied, Insurrection. Workmen assembled at the corner of the Rue de Bercy waited for a certain Le Marin, the revolutionary agent for the Faubourg saint marceau Watchwords were exchanged almost publicly. On the 5th of June, accordingly, a day of mingled rain and sun, General Lamarck's funeral procession traversed Paris with official military pomp, somewhat augmented through precaution. Two battalions with draped drums and reversed arms, ten thousand national guards with their swords at their sides, escorted the coffin. The hearse was drawn by young men. The officers of the Invalides came immediately behind it, bearing laurel branches. Then came an innumerable, strange, agitated multitude, the sectionaires of the Friends of the People, the Law School, the Medical School, refugees of all nationalities and Spanish, Italian, German, and Polish flags, tricolored horizontal banners, every possible sort of banner, children waving green boughs, stone cutters and carpenters who were on strike at the moment, printers who were recognizable by their paper caps, marched two by two, three by three, uttering cries, nearly all of them brandishing sticks, some brandishing sabers, without order and yet with a single soul. Now a tumultuous rout, again a column. Squads chose themselves leaders. A man armed with a pair of pistols in full view seemed to pass the host in review, and the files separated before him. On the side alleys of the boulevards, in the branches of the trees, on balconies, in windows, on the roofs, swarmed the heads of men, women, and children. All eyes were filled with anxiety. An armed throng was passing, and a terrified throng looked on. The government on its side was taking observations. It observed with its hand on its sword. Four squadrons of carabineers could be seen at the Place Louis XV, in their saddles, with their trumpets at their head, cartridge boxes filled, and muskets loaded, all in readiness to march. In the Latin country and in the Jardin des Plantes, the municipal guard echelon from street to street. At the Halle aux Vins, a squadron of dragoons. At the Greve, half of the Twelfth Light Infantry, the other half being at the Bastille the 6th Dragoons at the Celestines, and the courtyard of the Louvre full of artillery. The remainder of the troops were confined to their barracks, without reckoning the regiments of the environs of Paris. Power being uneasy, held suspended over the menacing multitude 24,000 soldiers in the city and 30,000 in the banlieue. Divers reports were in circulation in the cortege. Legitimist tricks were hinted at. They spoke of the Duc de Reichstadt, whom God had marked out for death at that very moment when the populace were designating him for the empire. One personage, whose name has remained unknown, announced that at a given hour two overseers, who had been won over, would throw open the doors of a factory of arms to the people. That which predominated on the uncovered brows of the majority of those present was enthusiasm mingled with dejection. Here and there also, in that multitude given over to such violent but noble emotions, there were visible genuine visages of criminals and ignoble mouths which said, Let us plunder. There are certain agitations which stir up the bottoms of marshes and make clouds of mud rise through the water a phenomenon to which well-drilled policemen are no strangers. The procession proceeded, with feverish slowness, from the house of the deceased by way of the boulevards as far as the Bastille. It rained from time to time. The rain mattered nothing to that throng. Many incidents, the coffin borne round the Vendôme column, stones thrown at the Duc de Fritz James, who was seen on a balcony with his hat on his head, the Gallic cock torn from a popular flag and dragged in the mire, 
a policeman wounded with a blow from a sword at the Port Saint Martin, an officer of the Twelfth Light Infantry saying aloud, I am a Republican, the Polytechnic School coming up unexpectedly against orders to remain at home, the shouts of Long live the Polytechnic, long live the Republic, marked the passage of the funeral train. At the Bastille, long lines of curious and formidable people who descended from the Faubourg Saint-Antoine effected a junction with the procession, and a certain terrible seething began to agitate the throng. One man was heard to say to another, "'Do you see that fellow with a red beard? He's the one who will give the word when we are to fire.' It appears that this red beard was present at another riot, the Quinisette affair, entrusted with this same function." The hearse passed the Bastille, traversed the small bridge, and reached the esplanade of the bridge of Austerlitz. There it halted. The crowd, surveyed at that moment with a bird's-eye view, would have presented the aspect of a comet, whose head was on the esplanade, and whose tail spread out over the Quai Berdon, covered the Bastille, and was prolonged on the boulevard as far as the Port Saint-Martin. A circle was traced around the hearst. The vast rout held its peace. Lafayette spoke and bade Lamarck farewell. This was a touching and august instant. All heads uncovered, all hearts beat high. All at once a man on horseback, clad in black, made his appearance in the middle of the group with a red flag, others say with a pike surmounted with a red liberty cap. Lafayette turned his head. Exelmans quitted the procession. This red flag raised a storm and disappeared in the midst of it. From the boulevard Bourdon to the bridge of Austerlitz, one of those clamors which resemble billows stirred the multitude. Two prodigious shouts went up. Lamarck to the Pantheon! Lafayette to the town hall! Some young men, amid the declamations of the throng, harnessed themselves and began to drag Lamarck in the hearse across the bridge of Austerlitz, and Lafayette in a hackneyed coach along the Quai Morland. In the crowd which surrounded and cheered Lafayette, it was noticed that a German showed himself named Ludwig Schneider, who died a centenarian afterwards, who had also been in the War of 1776, and who had fought at Trenton under Washington and at Brandywine under Lafayette. In the meantime, the municipal cavalry on the left bank had been set in motion and came to bar the bridge. On the right bank, the dragoons emerged from the Celestine and deployed along the Quai Morland. The men who were dragging Lafayette suddenly caught sight of them at the corner of the quay and shouted, "'The dragoons!' The dragoons advanced at a walk, in silence, with their pistols in their holsters, their swords in their scabbards, their guns slung in their leather sockets, with an air of gloomy expectation. They halted two hundred paces from the little bridge. The carriage in which sat Lafayette advanced to them, their ranks opened and allowed it to pass, and then closed behind it. At that moment the dragoons and the crowd touched. The women fled in terror. What took place during that fatal minute? No one can say. It is the dark moment when two clouds come together. Some declare that a blast of trumpets sounding the charge was heard in the direction of the arsenal. Others that a blow from a dagger was given by a child to a dragoon. The fact is that three shots were suddenly discharged. The first killed Cholet, chief of the squadron. The second killed an old deaf woman who was in the act of closing her window. The third singed the shoulder of an officer. A woman screamed, They are beginning too soon! And all at once a squadron of dragoons which had remained in the barracks up to this time was seen to debouche at a gallop with barred swords, through the Rue Bassompierre and the Boulevard Bourdon, sweeping all before them. Then all is said. The tempest is loosed. Stones rain down. A fusillade breaks forth. 
Many precipitate themselves to the bottom of the bank, and pass the small arm of the Seine, now filled in, the timber-yard of the Ile Louvrière, that vast citadel ready to hand, bristle with combatants. Stakes are torn up, pistol-shots fired, a barricade begun. The young men who are thrust back pass the Austerlitz bridge with the hearse at a run, and the municipal guard, the carabineers, rush up, the dragoons ply their swords, the crowd disperses in all directions, a rumor of war flies to all four quarters of Paris. Men shout, To arms! They run, tumble down, flee, resist. Wrath spreads abroad the riot as wind spreads a fire. End of Book Ten, Chapter Three. Chapters Four and Five of Book Ten of Les Miserables, Volume Four by Victor Hugo. Les Miserables, Volume Four by Victor Hugo, translated by Elizabeth Florence Hapgood. Book Ten, the Fifth of June, 1832. Chapters Four and Five. Chapter Four, The Ebullitions of Former Days. Nothing is more extraordinary than the first breaking out of a riot. Everything burst forth everywhere at once. Was it foreseen? Yes. Was it prepared? No. Whence comes it? From the pavements. Whence falls it? From the clouds. Here insurrection assumes the character of a plot, there of an improvisation. The first comer seizes a current of the throng and leads it whither he wills, a beginning full of terror in which is mingled a sort of formidable gaiety. First come clamors, the shops are closed, the displays of the merchants disappear. Then come isolated shots, people flee. Blows from gunstocks beat against porte cochere. Servants can be heard laughing in the courtyards of houses and saying, "'There's going to be a row!' A quarter of an hour had not elapsed when this is what was taking place in twenty different spots in Paris at once. In the Rue Saint-Croix de la Bretonneur, twenty young men, bearded and with long hair, entered a dram shop, and emerged a moment later carrying a horizontal tricolored flag covered with crepe, and having at their head three men armed, one with a sword, one with a gun, and the third with a pike. In the Rue des Nonandières, a very well-dressed bourgeois who had a prominent belly, a sonorous voice, a bald head, a lofty brow, a black beard, and one of those stiff moustaches which will not lie flat, offered cartridges publicly to passers-by. In the Rue Saint-Pierre-Montmartre, men with bare arms carried about a black flag, on which could be read in white letters this inscription, Republic or Death. In the Rue des Jeuneurs, Rue de Cadran, Rue de Montorgui, Rue Mandar, groups appeared waving flags on which could be distinguished in gold letters the word section with a number. One of these flags was red and blue with an almost imperceptible stripe of white between. They pillaged a factory of small arms on the boulevard Saint-Martin and three armorer shops, the first in the Rue Beaubourg, the second in the Rue Michel de Comte, the other in the Rue du Temple, in a few minutes the thousand hands of the crowd had seized and carried off two hundred and thirty guns, nearly all double-barreled, sixty-four swords, and eighty-three pistols. In order to provide more arms, one man took the gun, the other the bayonet. Opposite the Quai de la Grève, young men armed with muskets installed themselves in the houses of some women for the purpose of firing. One of them had a flintlock. They rang, entered, and set about making cartridges. One of these women relates, I did not know what cartridges were. It was my husband who told me. One cluster broke into a curiosity shop in the Rue des Villes Haudriettes and seized yataghans and Turkish arms. The body of a mason who had been killed by a gunshot lay in the Rue de la Perle. And then, on the right bank, the left bank, on the quays, on the boulevards, in the Latin country, in the Quartier de Halles, panting men, artisans, students, members of sections read proclamations and shouted, To arms! Broke street lanterns, unharnessed carriages, unpaved the street, broke into doors of houses, uprooted trees, rummaged cellars, rooted out hogsheads, heaped up paving stones, rough slabs, furniture and planks, and made barricades. 
They forced the bourgeois to assist them in this. They entered the dwellings of women. They forced them to hand over the swords and guns of their absent husbands. And they wrote on the door with writing, The arms have been delivered. Some signed their names to receipts for the guns and swords and said, Send for them tomorrow at the mayor's office. They disarmed isolated sentinels and national guardsmen in the streets on their way to the town hall. They tore the epaulets from officers. In the Rue de Cimitaire Saint-Nicolas, an officer of the National Guard, on being pursued by a crowd armed with clubs and foils, took refuge with difficulty in a house, whence he was only able to emerge at nightfall and in disguise. In the Quartier Saint-Jacques, the students swarmed out of their hotels and ascended the Rue Saint-Hyacinthe to the Café de Progrès, or descended to the Café des Sept Billards in the Rue des Maturines. There, in front of the door, young men mounted on the stone corner posts distributed arms. They plundered the timber yard in the Rue Transnonian in order to obtain material for barricades. On a single point, the inhabitants resisted. At the corner of the Rue Saint Avoy and the Rue Simon Le Franc, where they destroyed the barricade with their own hands. At a single point, the insurgents yielded. They abandoned a barricade begun in the Rue de Temple after having fired on a detachment of the National Guard and fled through the Rue de la Cordière. The detachment picked up in the barricades a red flag, a package of cartridges, and three hundred pistol balls. The National Guardsmen tore up the flag and carried off its tattered remains on the points of their bayonets. All that we are here relating slowly and successively took place simultaneously at all points in the city in the midst of a vast tumult, like a mass of tongues of lightning in one clap of thunder. In less than an hour, twenty-seven barricades sprang out of the earth in the quartier of the halls alone. In the center was that famous house, numero cinquante, which was the fortress of Jeanne and her six hundred companions and which, flanked on the one hand by the barricade at Saint-Marie, and on the other by the barricade of the Rue Maubeuse, commanded three streets, the Rue des Arquis, the Rue Saint-Martin, and the Rue Aubry le Boucher, which it faced. The barricades at right angles fell back, the one of the Rue Montorgui on the Grand Touranderie, the other of the Rue Geoffrey Longavine on the Rue Saint-Avoy, without reckoning innumerable barricades in twenty other quarters of Paris, in the Marais, in the mont saint Genevieve, one in the Rue Menil-Montan, where was visible a porte cochère torn from its hinges, another near the little bridge of the Hôtel Dieu, made with an écossais, which had been unharnessed and overthrown three hundred paces from the préfecture of police, at the barricade of the Rue des Menetrières a well-dressed man distributed money to the workmen. At the barricade of the Rue Grenetat, a horseman made his appearance and handed to the one who seemed to be the commander of the barricade what had the appearance of a roll of silver. Here, said he, this is to pay expenses, wine, etc. A light-haired young man without a cravat went from barricade to barricade carrying passwords. Another, with a naked sword, a blue police cap on his head, placed sentinels. In the interior, beyond the barricades, the wine shops and porters' lodges were converted into guard houses. Otherwise, the riot was conducted after the most scientific military tactics. The narrow, uneven, sinuous streets full of angles and turns were admirably chosen. The neighborhood of the Halls, in particular, a network of streets more intricate than a forest. The Society of the Friends of the People had, it was said, undertaken to direct the insurrection in the Quartier Saint Avoy. A man killed in the Rue de Ponceau, who was searched, had on his person a plan of Paris. That which had really undertaken the direction of the uprising was a sort of strange impetuosity, which was in the air. The insurrection had abruptly built barricades with one hand and with the other seized nearly all the posts of the garrison. In less than three hours, like a train of powder catching fire, the insurgents had invaded and occupied, on the right bank, the arsenal, the mayoralty of the Place Royale, the whole of the Marais, 
the Poppincourt Arms Manufactory, La Galliotte, the Chateau d'Eau, and all the streets near the halls. On the left bank, the barracks of the veterans, Saint Pellegrie, the Place Maubert, the powder magazine of the Du Moulin, and all the barriers. At five o'clock in the evening they were masters of the Bastille, of the Lingerie, of the Blanc Manteau. Their scouts had reached the Place des Victoires and menaced the bank, the Petit Père barracks, and the post office. A third of Paris was in the hands of the rioters. The conflict had been begun on a gigantic scale at all points, and, as a result of the disarming domiciliary visits and the armorer's shops hastily invaded, was that the combat which had begun with the throwing of stones was continued with gunshots. About six o'clock in the evening, the Passage du Soman became the field of battle. The uprising was at one end, the troops were at the other. They fired from one gate to the other. An observer, a dreamer, the author of this book, who had gone to get a near view of this volcano, found himself in the passage between the two fires. All that he had to protect him from the bullets was the swell of the two half-columns which separate the shops. He remained in this delicate situation for nearly half an hour. Meanwhile, the call to arms was beaten. The National Guard armed in haste. The legions emerged from the mayorties the regiments from their barracks. Opposite the passage de l'Ancre, a drummer received a blow from a dagger. Another, in the Rue de Cine, was assailed by thirty young men who broke his instrument and took away his sword. Another was killed in the Rue Grenier Saint-Lazare. In the Rue Michel Comte, three officers fell dead one after the other. Many of the municipal guards, on being wounded in the Rue des Lombards, retreated. In front of the Cour Batave, a detachment of National Guards found a red flag bearing the following inscription, Republican Revolution, numero 127. Was this a revolution, in fact? The insurrection had made of the center of Paris a sort of inextricable, torturous, colossal citadel. There was the hearth. There, evidently, was the question. All the rest was nothing but skirmishes. The proof that all would be decided there lay in the fact that there was no fighting going on there as yet. In some regiments the soldiers were uncertain, which added to the fearful uncertainty of the crisis. They recalled the popular ovation which had greeted the neutrality of the 53rd of the line in July 1830. Two intrepid men tried in great wars. The Marshal Lobau and General Bougot were in command. Bougot under Lobau. Enormous patrols composed of battalions of the line enclosed in entire companies of the National Guard and preceded by a commissary of police wearing his scarf of office went to reconnoiter the streets in rebellion. The insurgents on their side placed videttes at the corners of all open spaces, and audaciously sent their patrols outside the barricades. Each side was watching the other. The government, with an army in its hand, hesitated. The night was almost upon them, and the St. Mary toxin began to make itself heard. The minister of war at that time, Marshal Soult, who had seen Austerlitz, regarded this with a gloomy air. These old sailors, accustomed to correct maneuvers and having as resource and guide only tactics, that compass of battles, are utterly disconcerted in the presence of that immense foam which is called public wrath. The National Guards of the suburbs rushed up in haste and disorder. A battalion of the Twelfth Light came at a run from Saint-Denis. The Fourteenth of the Line arrived from Courbevoie. The batteries of the military school had taken up their positions on the carousel. Cannons were descending from Vincennes. Solitude was formed around the Tuileries. Louis-Philippe was perfectly serene. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 Originality of Paris during the last two years, as we have said, Paris had witnessed more than one insurrection. 
Nothing is generally more singularly calm than the physiognomy of Paris during an uprising beyond the bounds of the rebellious quarters. Paris very speedily accustoms herself to anything. It is only a riot, and Paris has so many affairs on hand that she does not put herself out for so small a matter. These colossal cities alone can offer such spectacles. These immense enclosures alone can contain at the same time civil war and an odd and indescribable tranquility. Ordinarily, when an insurrection commences, when the shopkeeper hears the drum, the call to arms, the general alarm, he contents himself with the remark, There appears to be a squabble in the Rue Saint-Martin, or in the Faubert Saint-Antoine, Often he adds carelessly, or somewhere in that direction. Later on, when the heart-rending and mournful hubbub of musketry and firing by platoons becomes audible, the shopkeeper says, It's getting hot. Hello, it's getting hot. A moment later, the riot approaches and gains in force. He shuts up his shop precipitously, hastily dons his uniform, that is to say, he places his merchandise in safety and risks his own person. Men fire in a square, in a passage, in a blind alley. They take and retake the barricade. Blood flows. The grape-shot riddles the fronts of houses. The balls kill people in their beds. Corpses encumber the streets. A few streets away, the shock of billiard balls can be heard in the cafés. The theaters open their doors and present vaudevilles. The curious laugh and chat a couple of paces distant from these streets filled with war. Hackney carriages go their way. Passers-by are going to a dinner somewhere in town, sometimes in the very quarter where the fighting is going on. In 1831, a fusillade was stopped to allow a wedding party to pass. At the time of the insurrection of 1839, in the Rue Saint-Martin, a little infirm old man, pushing a handcart surmounted by a tricolored rag, in which he had carafes filled with some sort of liquid, went and came from barricade to troops, and from troops to the barricade, offering his glasses of cocoa impartially, now to the government, now to anarchy. Nothing can be stranger, and this is the peculiar character of uprisings in Paris, which cannot be found in any other capital. To this end, two things are requisite, the size of Paris and its gaiety. The city of Voltaire and Napoleon is necessary. On this occasion, however, in the resort to arms of June 25, 1832, the great city felt something which was, perhaps, stronger than itself. It was afraid. Closed doors, windows, and shutters were to be seen everywhere, in the most distant and most disinterested quarters. The courageous took to arms, the poltroons hid. The busy and heedless passers-by disappeared. Many streets were empty at four o'clock in the morning. Alarming details were hawked about. Fatal news was disseminated. That they were masters of the bank, that there were six hundred of them in the cloister of St. Marie alone, entrenched and embattled in the church. That the line was not to be depended on. That Armand Carrel had been to see Marshal Closel, and that the Marshal had said, Get a regiment first. That Lafayette was ill, but that he had said to them, nevertheless, I am with you, I will follow you wherever there is room for a chair, that one must be on one's guard, that at night there would be people pillaging isolated dwellings in the deserted corners of Paris. There the imagination of the police that Anne Radcliffe mixed up with the government was recognizable, that a battery had been established in the Rue Aubry le Boucher that Lobau and Bougot were putting their heads together, and that at midnight, or at daybreak at latest, four columns would march simultaneously on the center of the uprising, the first coming from the Bastille, the second from the Porte Saint-Martin, the third from the Greve, the fourth from the Halles, that perhaps also the troops would evacuate Paris and withdraw to the Champs de Mars, that no one knew what would happen, but that this time it certainly was serious. People busied themselves over Marshal Soult's hesitations. Why did he not attack at once? 
it is certain that he was profoundly absorbed. The old lion seemed to scent an unknown monster in that gloom. Evening came, the theatres did not open. The patrols circulated with an air of irritation, passers-by were searched, suspicious persons were arrested. By nine o'clock, more than eight hundred persons had been arrested. The prefecture of police was encumbered with them, so was the conciergerie, so was la force. At the conciergerie, in particular, the long vault, which is called the Rue de Paris, was littered with trusses of straw, upon which lay a heap of prisoners, whom the man of Lyon, Lagrange, harangued valiantly. All that straw rustled by all these men produced the sound of a heavy shower. Elsewhere, prisoners slept in the open air in the meadows, piled on top of each other. Anxiety reigned everywhere, and a certain tremor which was not habitual with Paris. People barricaded themselves in their houses. Wives and mothers were uneasy. Nothing was to be heard but this, Ah, oh my God, he has not come home! There was hardly even the distant rumble of a vehicle to be heard. People listened on their thresholds to the rumors, the shouts, the tumult, the dull and indistinct sounds, to the things that were said. It is the cavalry, or those are the caissons galloping, to the trumpets, the drums, the firing, and above all, to that lamentable alarm peal from St. Marie. They waited for the first cannon shot. Men sprang up at the corners of the streets and disappeared, shouting, Go home! And people made haste to bolt their doors. They said, How will all this end? From moment to moment, in proportion as the darkness descended, Paris seemed to take on a more mournful hue from the formidable flaming of the revolt. End of Book 10, Chapters 4 and 5 Chapters 1 and 2 of Book 11 of Les Miserables, Volume 4, by Victor Hugo Les Miserables, Volume 4, by Victor Hugo Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood Book 11 The Atom Fraternizes with the Hurricane Chapter 1 Some Explanations with Regard to the Origin of Gavroche's Poetry the influence of an academician on this poetry. At the instant when the insurrection, arising from the shock of the populace and the military in front of the arsenal, started a movement in advance and towards the rear in the multitude which was following the hearse, and which, through the whole length of the boulevards, weighed, so to speak, on the head of the procession, there arose a frightful ebb. The rout was shaken, their ranks were broken, all ran, fled, made their escape, some with shouts of attack, others with the pallor of flight. The great river which covered the boulevards divided in a twinkling, overflowed to right and left, and spread in torrents over two hundred streets at once with the roar of a sewer that has broken loose. At that moment, a ragged child who was coming down through the Rue Menilmontant, holding in his hand a branch of blossoming laburnum, which he had just plucked out of the heights of the Belleville, caught sight of an old holster pistol in the show window of a bric-a-brac merchant's shop. Mother, what's your name? I'm going to borrow your machine. And off he ran with the pistol. Two minutes later, a flood of frightened bourgeois who were fleeing through the Rue Amelo and the Rue Basse encountered the lad brandishing his pistol and singing, La nuit on ne voit rien. Les jours on voit très bien. Dans écrit apocrypha, les bourgeois se bourrifent, pratiquaient avec tout, 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 chapeau pointu. It was little Gavroche on his way to the wars. On the boulevard, he noticed that the pistol had no trigger. Who was the author of that couplet which served to punctuate his march, and of all the other songs which he was fond of singing on occasion? We know not. Who does know? Himself, perhaps. However, Gavroche was well up in all the popular tunes in circulation, and he mingled them with his own chirpings. An observing urchin and a rogue, he made a potpourri of the voices of nature and the voices of Paris. He combined the repertory of the birds with the repertory of the workshops. He was acquainted with thieves, a tribe contiguous to his own. He had, it appears, been for three months apprenticed to a printer. 
he had one day executed a commission for M. Bourlomien, one of the forty. Gavroche was a gammon of letters. Moreover, Gavroche had no suspicion of the fact that when he had offered the hospitality of his elephant to two brats on that villainously rainy night, it was to his own brothers that he had played the part of providence. His brothers in the evening, his father in the morning, that is what his night had been like. On quitting the Rue de Ballet at daybreak, he had returned in haste to the elephant, had artistically extracted from it the two brats, had shared with them some sort of breakfast which he had invented, and had then gone away, confiding them to that good mother, the street, who had brought him up almost entirely. On leaving them, he had appointed to meet them at the same spot in the evening, and had left them this discourse by way of a farewell. I break a cane. Otherwise expressed, I cut my stick, or as they say at the court, I file off. If you don't find Papa and Mama, young uns, come back here this evening. I'll scramble you up some supper, and I'll give you a shakedown. The two children, picked up by some policeman and placed in the refuge, or stolen by some mountebank, or having simply strayed off in that immense Chinese puzzle of a Paris, did not return. The lowest depths of the actual social world are full of these lost traces. Gavroche did not see them again. Ten or twelve weeks had elapsed since that night. More than once he had scratched the back of his head and said, Where the devil are my two children? In the meantime, he had arrived, pistol in hand, in the Rue du pont aux Chaux. He noticed that there was but one shop open in that street, and, a matter of worthy reflection, that it was a pastry-cook's shop. This presented a providential occasion to eat another apple turnover before entering the unknown. Gavroche halted, fumbled in his fob, turned his pocket inside out, found nothing, not even a sou, and began to shout, Help! It is hard to miss the last cake. Nevertheless, Gavroche pursued his way. Two minutes later, he was in the Rue Saint-Louis. While traversing the Rue du Parc Royal, he felt called upon to make good the loss of the apple turnover which had been impossible, and he indulged himself in the immense delight of tearing down the theatre posters in broad daylight. A little further on, on catching sight of a group of comfortable-looking persons, who seemed to be landed proprietors, he shrugged his shoulders, and spit out at random before him this mouthful of philosophical bile as they passed. How fat those moneyed men are! They're drunk. They just wallow in good dinners. Ask them what they do with their money. They don't know. They eat it. That's what they do. As much as their bellies will hold. Chapter 2. Gavroche on the March The brandishing of a triggerless pistol, grasped in one's hand in the open street, is so much of a public function that Gavroche felt his fervour increasing with every moment. Amid the scraps of the Marseillaise, which he was singing, he shouted, All goes well. I suffer a great deal in my left paw. I'm all broken up with rheumatism, but I'm satisfied, citizens. All that the bourgeois have to do is to bear themselves well. I'll sneeze them out subversive couplets. What are the police spies? Dogs. And I'd just like to have one of them at the end of my pistol. I'm just from the boulevard, my friends. It's getting hot there. It's getting into a little boil. It's simmering. It's time to skim the pot. Forward march, men. Let an impure blood inundate the furrows. I give my days to my country. I shall never see my concubine more, Nini. Finished? Yes, Nini. But never mind. Long live joy. Let's fight, Crebleu. I've had enough of despotism. At that moment, the horse of a lancer of the National Guard having fallen, Gavroche laid his pistol on the pavement, and picked up the man. Then he assisted in raising the horse. After which, he picked up his pistol and resumed his way. In the Rue de Thorigny, all was peace and silence. This apathy, peculiar to the Marais, presented a contrast with the vast surrounding uproar. Four gossips were chatting in a doorway. Scotland has trios of witches, 
Paris has quartets of old gossiping hags, and the Thou shalt be king could be quite as mournfully hurled at Bonaparte in the Carrefour Bordoyer as at Macbeth on the heath of Armour. The croak would be almost identical. The gossips of the Rue de Thorigny busied themselves only with their own concerns. Three of them were portresses, and the fourth was a rag-picker with her basket on her back. All four of them seemed to be standing at the four corners of old age, which are decrepitude, decay, ruin, and sadness. The rag-picker was humble. In this open-air society it is the rag-picker who salutes, and the portress who patronizes. This is caused by the corner for refuse, which is fat or lean, according to the will of the portresses, and after the fancy of the one who makes the heap. There may be kindness in the broom. This rag-picker was a grateful creature, and she smiled, with what a smile, on the three portresses. Things of this nature were said. Ah, by the way, is your cat still cross? Good gracious! Cats are naturally the enemies of dogs, you know. It's the dogs who complain. And people also. But the fleas from a cat don't go after people. That's not the trouble. Dogs are dangerous. I remember one year when there were so many dogs that it was necessary to put it in the newspapers. That was at the time when there were at the Tuileries great sheep that drew the little carriage of the King of Rome. Do you remember the King of Rome? I like the Duc de Bordeaux better. I knew Louis the Eighteenth. I prefer Louis the Eighteenth. Meat is awfully dear, isn't it, Mother Patagon? Ah, don't mention it. The butcher's shop is a horror. A horrible horror. One can't afford anything but the poor cuts nowadays. Here the rag-picker interposed. Ladies, business is dull. The refuse heaps are miserable. No one throws anything away any more. They eat everything. There are poorer people than you, la Vogolem. Ah, that's true, replied the rag-picker with deference. I have a profession. A pause succeeded, and the rag-picker, yielding to that necessity for boasting which lies at the bottom of man, added, In the morning, on my return home, I pick over my basket. I sort my things. This makes heaps in my room. I put the rags in a basket, the cores and the stalks in a bucket, the linen in my cupboard, the woolen stuff in my commode, the old papers in the corner of the window, and things that are good to eat in my bowl, the bits of glass in my fireplace, the old shoes behind my door, and the bones under my bed. Gavroche had stopped behind her and was listening. "'Old ladies,' said he, "'what do you mean by talking politics?' He was assailed by a broadside, composed of a quadruple howl. Here's another rascal. What's he got in his paddle? A pistol? Well, I'd like to know what sort of a beggar brat this is. That sort of animal is never easy unless he's overturning the authorities. Gavroche disdainfully contented himself, by way of reprisal, with elevating the tip of his nose with his thumb and opening his hands wide. The rag-picker cried, You malicious, bare-pawed little wretch! The one who answered to the name of Patagon clapped her hands together in horror. There's going to be evil doings, that's certain. The errand-boy next door has a little pointed beard. I have seen him pass every day with a young person in a pink bonnet on his arm. Today I saw him pass, and he had a gun on his arm. Ma'am Bachot says that last week there was a revolution at... at... Where's the calf? At Pontoise. And then, there you see him, that horrid scamp, with his pistol. It seems that the Celestines are full of pistols. What do you suppose the government can do with good-for-nothings who don't know how to do anything but contrive ways of upsetting the world, when we had just begun to get a little quiet after all the misfortunes that have happened, good Lord? To that poor queen whom I saw pass in the tumbril. And all this is going to make tobacco dearer. It's infamous! and I shall certainly go to see him beheaded on the guillotine, the wretch. "'You've got the sniffles, old lady,' said Gavroche. "'Blow your promontory.' And he passed on. 
When he was in the Rue Pave, the rag-picker occurred to his mind, and he indulged in this soliloquy. You are in the wrong to insult the revolutionists, Mother Dust Heap Corner. This pistol is in your interests. It's so that you may have more good things to eat in your basket. All at once he heard a shout behind him. It was the portress Patagon who had followed him, and who was shaking her fist at him in the distance and crying, You are nothing but a bastard. Oh, come now, said Gavroche. I don't care a brass farthing for that. Shortly afterwards he passed the Hotel La Moignon. There he uttered this appeal, Forward march to the battle, and he was seized with a fit of melancholy. He gazed at his pistol with an air of reproach, which seemed to attempt to appease it. I'm going off, said he, but you won't go off. One dog may distract the attention from another dog. A very gaunt poodle came along at the moment. Gavroche felt compassion for him. My poor doggy, said he, you must have gone and swallowed a cask, for all the hoops are visible. Then he directed his course towards Lorme Saint Gervais. End of Book 11, Chapters 1 and 2. Chapters 3 to 6 of Book 11 of Les Miserables, Volume 4 by Victor Hugo. Les Miserables, Volume 4 by Victor Hugo. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Book 11 The Atom Fraternizes with the Hurricane. Chapter 3 just indignation of a hairdresser. The worthy hairdresser, who had chased from his shop the two little fellows to whom Gavroche had opened the paternal interior of the elephant, was at that moment in his shop engaged in shaving an old soldier of the legion who had served under the empire. They were talking. The hairdresser had, naturally, spoken to the veteran of the riot, then of General Lamarck, and from Lamarck they had passed to the Emperor. Then sprang up a conversation between barber and soldier, which Prudhomme, had he been present, would have enriched with arabesques, and which he would have entitled, Dialogue between the razor and the sword. How did the Emperor ride, sir? said the barber. Badly. He did not know how to fall, so he never fell. Did he have fine horses? He must have had fine horses. On the day when he gave me my cross, I noticed his beast. It was a racing mare, perfectly white. Her ears were very wide apart, her saddle deep, a fine head marked with a black star, a very long neck, strongly articulated knees, prominent ribs, oblique shoulders, and a powerful crupper, a little more than fifteen hands in height. A pretty horse remarked the hairdresser. It was His Majesty's beast. The hairdresser felt that after this observation a short silence would be fitting, so he conformed himself to it, and then went on. The Emperor was never wounded but once, was he, sir? The old soldier replied with the calm and sovereign tone of a man who had been there. In the heel, at Ratisbon. I never saw him so well dressed as on that day, he was as neat as a new Sioux. And you, Mr. Veteran, you must have been often wounded. I, said the soldier. Ah, not to amount to anything. At Marengo I received two sabre blows to the back of my neck, a bullet in the right arm at Austerlitz, another in the left hip at Jena. At Friedland, a thrust from a bayonet there... At the Moskowa, seven or eight lance thrusts, no matter where. At Lutzen, a splinter of a shell crushed one of my fingers. Ah, and then at Waterloo, a ball from a bassayan in the thigh, that's all. How fine that is, exclaimed the hairdresser, in Pindaric accent. To die on the field of battle. On my word of honour, rather than die in bed of an illness, slowly, a bit by bit each day with drugs, cataplasms, syringes, medicines. I should prefer to receive a cannonball in my belly. You're not over-fastidious, said the soldier. He had hardly spoken when a fearful crash shook the shop. The show window had suddenly been fractured. 
the wig-maker turned pale. Ah, good God, he exclaimed, it's one of them. What? A cannonball. Here it is, said the soldier, and he picked up something that was rolling about the floor. It was a pebble. The hairdresser ran to the broken window and beheld Gavroche fleeing at the full speed towards the Marche Saint-Jean. As he passed the hairdresser's shop, Gavroche, who had the two brats still in his mind, had not been able to resist the impulse to say good day to him, and had flung a stone through his pane. "'You see?' shrieked the hairdresser, who from white had turned blue. "'That fellow returns and does mischief for the pure pleasure of it. What has anyone done to that gammon?' Chapter 4 The Child is Amazed at the Old Man in the meantime, in the Marché Saint-Jean, where the post had already been disarmed, Gavroche had just effected a junction with a band led by Enjolras, Corfera, Combeferre, and Fouillet. They were armed after a fashion. Bahorel and Jean Prouvaire had found them and swelled the group. Enjolras had a double-barreled hunting gun, Comfer, the gun of a national guard bearing the number of his legion, and in his belt two pistols which his unbuttoned coat allowed to be seen. Jean Prouvaire, an old cavalry musket, Bahorel, a rifle. Corfedac was brandishing an unsheathed sword cane. Fouillet, with a naked sword in his hand, marched at their head, shouting, Long live Poland! They reached the Quai Morlon, cravatless, hatless, breathless, soaked by the rain with lightning in their eyes. Gavroche accosted them calmly. Where are we going? Come along, said Corfeirac. Behind Fouillet marched, or rather bounded, Bahorel, who was like a fish in water in a riot. He wore a scarlet waistcoat and indulged in the sort of words which break everything. His waistcoat astounded a passer-by, who cried in bewilderment, "'Here are the Reds!' "'The Reds! The Reds!' retorted Bahorel. "'A queer kind of fear, bourgeois. "'For my part, I don't tremble before a poppy. "'The little red hat inspires me with no alarm. "'Take my advice, bourgeois. "'Let's leave fear of the Red to horned cattle.' He caught sight of a corner of the wall in which was placarded the most peaceable sheet of paper in the world, a permission to eat eggs, a Lenten admonition addressed by the Archbishop of Paris to his flock. Bahorel exclaimed, Flock? A polite way of saying geese. And he tore the charge from the nail. This conquered Gavroche. From that instant, Gavroche set himself to study Bahorel. Bahorel, observed Enjolras, you are wrong. You should have let that charge alone. He is not the person with whom we have to deal. You are wasting your wrath to no purpose. Take care of your supply. One does not fire out of the ranks with the soul any more than with a gun. Each one in his own fashion, Enjolras, retorted Bahorel. This bishop's prose shocks me. I want to eat eggs without being permitted. Your style is the hot and cold. I am amusing myself. Besides, I'm not wasting myself. I'm getting a start. And if I tore down that charge, Herkle, it was only to whet my appetite. This word, Herkle, struck Gavroche. He sought out all occasions for learning, and that terror down of posters possessed his esteem. He inquired of him, What does Herkle mean? Bahorel answered, It means cursed name of a dog, in Latin. Here Bahorel recognized at a window a pale young man with a black beard who was watching them as they passed, probably a friend of the ABC. He shouted to him, Quick, cartridges, parabellum! A fine man, that's true, said Gavroche, who now understood Latin. A tumultuous retinue accompanied them, Students, artists, young men affiliated to the Cougord of Ve, artisans, longshoremen, armed with clubs and bayonets, 
some, like Combeferre, with pistols thrust into their trousers. An old man, who appeared to be extremely aged, was walking in the band. He had no arms, and he made great haste, so that he might not be left behind, although he had a thoughtful air. Gavroche caught sight of him. Hexexa, said he to Corfera. He's an old duffer. It was Monsieur Mabeau. Chapter 5 The Old Man Let us recount what has taken place. Enjolras and his friends had been on the boulevard Boudon, near the public storehouses, at the moment when the dragoons had made their charge. Enjolras, Corfeyrac, and Comfer were among those who had taken to the Rue Bassompierre, shouting, To the barricade! In the Rue Lesdiguières, they had met an old man walking along. What had attracted their attention was that the good man was walking in a zigzag, as though he were intoxicated. Moreover, he had his hat in his hand, although it had been raining all the morning, and was raining pretty briskly at the very time. Corfeyrac had recognized Father Mabeau. He knew him through having many times accompanied Marius as far as his door. As he was acquainted with the peaceful and more than timid habits of the old beetle book collector, and was amazed at the sight of him in the midst of that uproar, a couple of paces from the cavalry charges, almost in the midst of a fusillade, hatless in the rain, and strolling about among the bullets, he had accosted him, and the following dialogue had been exchanged between the rioter of fire and the octogenarian. Monsieur Mabeau, go to your home. Why? There's going to be a row. That's well. Thrust with the sword and firing, Monsieur Mabeau. That is well. Firing from cannon. That is good. Where are the rest of you going? We are going to fling government to the earth. That is good and he had set out to follow them. From that moment forth, he had not uttered a word. His step had suddenly become firm. Artisans had offered him their arms. He had refused with a sign of the head. He advanced nearly to the front of the rank of the column, with the movement of a man who is marching, and the countenance of a man who is sleeping. "'What a fierce old fellow!' muttered the students. The rumour spread through the troop that he was a former number of the convention, an old regicide. The mob had turned in through the Rue de la Verrieri. Little Gavroche marched in front with that deafening song which made of him a sort of trumpet. He sang, Voici la lune qui paraît, quand irons-nous dans la forêt? Demandez Chalot à Chalotte, tout 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 pour château, je n'ai qu'un deux, qu'un roi, qu'un liard et qu'une botte. Pour avoir beau de grands matins, d'arroser à la même des thèmes, de moigneux et tant et ribot, zizizi pour partie, je n'ai qu'un dieu, qu'un roi, qu'un liard et qu'un bot, et ces deux pauvres petits loups, comme deux grives et saines sous, un tigre envoyé dans sa grotte, dans don don pour ma don. Je n'ai qu'un dieu, qu'un roi, qu'un liard et qu'une botte. L'un juré et l'autre sacré, quand dirons-nous dans la forêt, demandez Charlotte à Charlotte. Tin, tin, tin pour patine, je n'ai qu'un dieu, qu'un roi, qu'un liard et qu'une botte. They directed their course towards Saint Marie. Chapter 6 Recruits the band augmented every moment. Near the Rue des Billettes, a man of lofty stature, whose hair was turning grey, and whose bold and daring mien was remarked by Courfeyrac, Enjolras, and Combeferre, but whom none of them knew, joined them. Gavroche, who was occupied in singing, whistling, humming, running on ahead, and pounding on the shutters of the shops with the butt of his triggerless pistol, paid no attention to this man. It chanced that in the Rue de la Verrieri, they passed in front of Courfeyrac's door. This happens just right, said Courfeyrac. I have forgotten my purse, and I have lost my hat. 
He quitted the mob and ran up to his quarters at full speed. He seized an old hat and his purse. He also seized a large square coffer of the dimensions of a large valise, which was concealed under his soiled linen. As he descended again at a run, the portress hailed him. Monsieur de Coferac. What's your name, portress? The portress stood bewildered. Why, you know perfectly well, I'm the concierge. My name is Mother Vauvant. Well, if you call me Monsieur de Coferac again, I shall call you Mother de Vauvant. Now speak. What's the matter? What do you want? There is someone who wants to speak with you. Who is it? I don't know. Where is he? In my lodge. The devil! ejaculated Corfedac. But the person has been waiting your return for over an hour, said the portress. At the same time, a sort of pale, thin, small, freckled and youthful artisan, clad in a tattered blouse and patched trousers of ribbed velvet, and who had rather the air of a girl accoutred as a man than of a man, emerged from the lodge and said to Corfedac in a voice which was not the least in the world like a woman's voice, Monsieur Marius, if you please. He is not here. Will he return this evening? I know nothing about it, and Corfedac added, For my part, I shall not return. The young man gazed steadily at him and said, Why not? Because. Where are you going, then? What business is that of yours? Would you like to have me carry your coffer for you? I am going to the barricades. Would you like to have me go with you? If you like, replied Corfedac, the street is free, the pavements belong to everyone. And he made his escape at a run to join his friends. When he had rejoined them, he gave the coffer to one of them to carry. It was only a quarter of an hour after this that he saw the young man, who had actually followed them. A mob does not go precisely where it intends. We have explained that a gust of wind carries it away. They overshot St. Mary and found themselves, without precisely knowing how, in the Rue Saint-Denis. End of Book 11, Chapters 3 to 6 Chapter 1 of Book 12 of Les Miserables, Volume 4 by Victor Hugo. Les Miserables, Volume 4 by Victor Hugo. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Book 12, Corinth. Chapter 1 History of Corinth from its Foundation. The Parisians who nowadays on entering on the Rue Rambuteau at the end near the Halle, notice on their right, opposite the Rue Mondetour, a basket maker's shop having for its sign a basket in the form of Napoleon the Great with this inscription, Napoleon is made holy of willow. Have no suspicion of the terrible scenes which this very spot witnessed hardly thirty years ago. It was there that lay the Rue de la Chanverie, which ancient deeds spell Chanverrerie, and the celebrated public house called Corinth. The reader will remember all that has been said about the barricade effected at this point, and eclipsed, by the way, by the barricade Saint-Marie. It was on this famous barricade of the Rue de la Chanverrie, now fallen into profound obscurity, that we are about to shed a little light. May we be permitted to recur, for the sake of clearness in the recital, to the simple means which we have already employed in the case of Waterloo. Persons who wish to picture to themselves in a tolerably exact manner the constitution of the houses which stood at that epoch near the Pont Saint-Eustache at the northeast angle of the Halle of Paris, where today lies the embouchure of the Rue Rambuteau, have only to imagine an N touching the Rue Saint-Denis with its summit and the Halle with its base, and whose two vertical bars should form the Rue de la Grande Truanderie and the Rue de la Chanverrie, and whose transverse bars should be formed by the Rue de la Petite Truanderie. The old Rue Mondetour cut the three strokes of the N at the most crooked angles, 
so that the labyrinth confusion of these four streets suffice to form on a space three fathoms square between the Halle and the Rue Saint-Denis on the one hand, and between the Rue des Signy and the Rue des Prechures on the other, seven islands of houses, oddly cut up, of varying sizes, placed crosswise and haphazard, and barely separated, like the blocks of stone in a dock, by narrow crannies. We say narrow crannies, and we can give no more just idea of those dark, contracted, many-angled alleys lined with eight-story buildings. These buildings were so decrepit that, in the Rue de la Chanvrerie and the Rue de la Petite Truanderie, the fronts were shored up with beams running from one house to another. The street was narrow and the gutter broad. The pedestrian there walked on a pavement that was always wet, skirting little stalls resembling cellars, big posts encircled with iron hoops, excessive heaps of refuse, and gates armed with enormous century-old gratings. The Rue Rambuteau has devastated all that. The name of Mont Tour paints marvelously well the sinuosities of that whole set of streets. A little further on they are found still better expressed by the Rue Pirouette, which ran into the Rue Mont de Tour. The passer-by who got entangled from the Rue Saint-Denis in the Rue de la Chanvrerie beheld it gradually close in before him, as though he had entered an elongated funnel. At the end of this street, which was very short, he found further passage barred in the direction of the Halle by a tall row of houses, and he would have thought himself in a blind alley had he not perceived on the right and left two dark cuts through which he could make his escape. This was the Rue Mondetour, which on one side ran into the Rue des Prechures, and on the other into the Rue du Signy and the Petite Truanderie. At the bottom of this sort of cul-de-sac, at the angle of the cutting on the right, there was to be seen a house which was not so tall as the rest, and which formed a sort of cape in the street. It is in this house, of two stories only, that an illustrious wine shop had been merrily installed three hundred years before. This tavern created a joyous noise in the very spot which old Theophilus described in the following couplet, La branlée l'esquelette horrible d'un pauvre amant qui s'est pendu. There swings the horrible skeleton of a poor lover who hung himself. The situation was good, and tavern keepers succeeded each other there from father to son. In the time of Mathieu and Regnier, this cabaret was called the Pot de Rosé, and as the rebus was then in fashion, it had for its signboard a post, Potio, painted rose collar. In the last century, the worthy Natois, one of the fantastic masters nowadays despised by the stiff school, having got drunk many times in this wine shop, at the very table where Regnier had drunk his fill, had painted, by way of gratitude, a bunch of Corinth grapes on the pink post. The keeper of the cabaret, in his joy, had changed his device and had caused to be placed in gilt letters beneath the bunch these words, At the bunch of Corinth grapes, au raison du Corinth. Hence the name of Corinth. Nothing is more natural to drunken men than ellipses. The ellipsis is the zigzag of the phrase. Corinth gradually dethroned the pot de rose the last proprietor of the dynasty, Father Hucheloup, no longer acquainted even with the tradition, had the post painted blue. A room on the ground floor, where the bar was situated, one on the first floor containing a billiard table, a wooden spiral staircase piercing the ceiling, wine on the tables, smoke on the walls, candles in broad daylight, this was the style of this cabaret. A staircase with a trap door in the lower room led to the cellar. On the second floor were the lodgings of the Hucheloup family. They were reached by a staircase which was a ladder rather than a staircase, and had for their entrance only a private door in the large room on the first floor. Under the roof, in two mansard attics, were the nests for the servants. The kitchen shared the ground floor with the tap room. 
Father Hucheloup had, possibly, been born a chemist, but the fact is that he was a cook. People did not confine themselves to drinking alone in his wine shop. They also ate there. Hucheloup had invented a capital thing which could be eaten nowhere but in his house, stuffed carps, which he called carpe au gras. These were eaten by the light of the tallow candle or of a lamp of the time of Louis the Sixteenth on tables to which were nailed waxed cloths in lieu of tablecloths. People came thither from a distance. Hucheloup, one fine morning, had seen fit to notify passers-by of this speciality. He had dipped a brush in a pot of black paint, and as he was an orthographer on his own account, as well as a cook after his own fashion, he had improvised on his wall this remarkable inscription. Carpes ho grat. One winter, the rainstorms and the showers had taken a fancy to obliterate the S which terminated the first word, and the G which began the third. This is what remained. Carpe ho rat. Time and rain assisting. A humble gastronomical announcement had become a profound piece of advice. In this way it came about that though he knew no French, Father Hucheloup understood Latin that he had evoked philosophy from his kitchen, and that, desirous simply of effacing Lent, he had equaled Horace. And the striking thing about it was that that also meant, enter my wine shop. Nothing of all this is in existence now. The Mondetour labyrinth was disemboweled and widely opened in 1847, and probably no longer exists at the present moment. The Rue de la Chanvrerie and Corinth have disappeared beneath the pavement of the Rue Rambuteau. As we have already said, Corinth was the meeting place, if not the rallying point, of Corferac and his friends. It was Grantaire who had discovered Corinth. He had entered it on account of the Carpe au Horat, and had returned thither on account of the Carpe au Gras. There they drank, there they ate, there they shouted. They did not pay much, they paid badly, they did not pay at all, but they were always welcome. Father Hucheloup was a jovial host. Hucheloup, that amiable man, as was just said, was a wine shopkeeper with a moustache, an amusing variety. He always had an ill-tempered air, seemed to wish to intimidate his customers, grumbled at the people who entered his establishment, and had rather the mean of seeking a quarrel with them than of serving them with soup. And yet, we insist upon the word, people were always welcome there. This oddity had attracted customers to his shop, and brought him young men who said to each other, Come here, Father Hucheloup growl. And he had been a fencing master. All of a sudden he would burst out laughing, a big voice, a good fellow. He had a comic foundation under a tragic exterior. He asked nothing better than to frighten you, very much like those snuff boxes which are in the shape of a pistol. The detonation makes one sneeze. Mother Hucheloup, his wife, was a bearded and very homely creature. About 1830, Father Hucheloup died. With him disappeared the secret of stuffed carps. His inconsolable widow continued to keep the wine shop, but the cooking deteriorated and became execrable. The wine, which had always been bad, became fearfully bad. Nevertheless, Corferac and his friends continued to go to Corinth, out of pity, as Bossuet said. The widow Hucheloup was breathless and misshapen and given to rustic recollections. She deprived them of their flatness by her pronunciation. She had a way of her own of saying things, which spiced her reminiscences of the village and of her springtime. It had formerly been her delight, so she affirmed, to hear the Lou de Gorget chanter dans les ogrepinis, to hear the redbreasts sing in the hawthorn trees. The hall on the first floor, where the restaurant was situated, was a large and long apartment, encumbered with stools, chairs, benches, and tables, 
and with a crippled, lame old billiard table. It was reached by a spiral staircase, which terminated in the corner of the room at a square hole like the hatchway of a ship. This room, lighted by a single narrow window, and by a lamp that was always burning, had the air of a garret. All the four-footed furniture comported itself as though it had but three legs. The whitewashed walls had for their only ornament the following quatrain in honor of Mame Hucheloup. Il étonné à dix pas, il épouvanté à dieu. Une verrou habité en son ne hasardu, en tremblé à chaque instant que elle ne vous la mouche, et que un beau jour son ne ne tombe dans sa bouche. She astounds at ten paces. She frightens at two. A wart inhabits her hazardous nose. You tremble every instant lest she should blow it at you, and lest some fine day her nose should tumble into her mouth. This was scrawled in charcoal on the wall. Mame Hucheloup, a good likeness, went and came from morning till night before this quatrain with the most perfect tranquility. Two serving maids named Metalote and Gibelote, who had never been known by any other names, helped Mame Hucheloup to set on the tables the jugs of poor wine and the various broths which were served to the hungry patrons in earthenware bowls. Metalote, large and plump, red-haired and noisy, the favorite ex-sultana of the defunct Hucheloup, was homelier than any mythological monster, be it what it may. Still, as it becomes the servant to always keep in the rear of the mistress, she was less homely than Mame Hucheloup. Gibelote, tall, delicate, white, with a lymphatic pallor, with circles round her eyes and drooping lids, always languid and weary, afflicted with what may be called chronic lassitude, the first up in the house and the last in bed, waited on everyone, even the other maid, silently and gently, smiling through her fatigue with a vague and sleepy smile. Before entering the restaurant room, the visitor read on the door the following line written there in chalk by Corferac. Regale si tu pu, it mange si tu lo sais. Treat if you can, and eat if you dare. End of Book Twelve, Chapter One. Chapter Two of Book Twelve of Les Miserables, Volume Four by Victor Hugo. Les Miserables, Volume Four by Victor Hugo. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Book Twelve. Corinth, Chapter 2, Preliminary Gaieties Lagle de Mieux, as the reader knows, lived more with Jolie than elsewhere. He had a lodging as a bird has one in a branch. The two friends lived together, ate together, slept together. They had everything in common, even Musichetta, to some extent. They were what the subordinate monks who accompany monks are called, Beanie. On the morning of the 5th of June, they went to Corinth to breakfast. Jolie, who was all stuffed up, had a catar, which Lagle was beginning to share. Lagle's coat was threadbare, but Jolie was well dressed. It was about nine o'clock in the morning when they opened the door of Corinth. They ascended to the first floor. Metalote and Gibelote received them. Oysters, cheese, and ham, said Lagle, and they seated themselves at a table. The wine shop was empty. There was no one there but themselves. Gibelot, knowing Jolie and Lagle, set a bottle of wine on the table. While they were busy with their first oysters, a head appeared at the hatchway of the staircase, and a voice said, I am passing by. I smell from the street a delicious odor of brie cheese. I enter. It was Grantaire. Grantaire took a stool and drew up to the table. At the sight of Grantaire, Gibelote placed two bottles of wine on the table. That made three. Are you going to drink those two bottles? Lagle inquired of Grantaire. Grantaire replied, All are ingenious. Thou alone art ingenious. Two bottles never yet astonished a man. The others had begun by eating. 
Grantaire began by drinking. Half a bottle was rapidly gulped down. So you have a hole in your stomach, began Lagle again. You have one in your elbow, said Grantaire. And after having emptied his glass, he added, Ah, by the way, Lagle of the funeral oration, your coat is old. I should hope so, retorted Lagle. That's why we get on well together, my coat and I. It has acquired all my folds. It does not bind me anywhere. It is molded on my deformities. It falls in with all my movements. I am only conscious of it because it keeps me warm. Old coats are just like old friends. That's true, ejaculated Jolie, striking into the dialogue. An old goat is an old abbey. Especially in the mouth of a man whose head is stuffed up, said Grantaire. Grantaire, demanded Lagle, have you just come from the boulevard? No, we have just seen the head of the procession pass, Jolie and I. It's a marvelous sight, said Jolie. How quiet this street is, exclaimed Lagle. Who would suspect that Paris was turned upside down? How plainly it is to be seen that in former days there were nothing but convents here. In this neighborhood, Dubrule and Saval gave a list of them, and so does the Abbey Le Bouff. They were all round here. They fairly swarmed, booted and barefooted, shaven, bearded, gray, black, white, Franciscans, Minims, Capuchins, Carmelites, Little Augustines, Great Augustines, Old Augustines. There was no end of them. Don't let's talk of monks, interrupted Grantaire. It makes one want to scratch oneself. Then he exclaimed, Boo! I've just swallowed a bad oyster. Now hypochondria is taking possession of me again. The oysters are spoiled. The servants are ugly. I hate the human race. I just passed through the Rue Richelieu in front of the big public library. That pile of oyster shells, which is called a library, is disgusting even to think of. What paper, what ink, what scrawling, and all that has been written. What rascal was it who said that man was a featherless biped? And then I met a pretty girl of my acquaintance, who is as beautiful as the spring, worthy to be called Florial, and who is delighted, enraptured, as happy as the angels, because a wretch yesterday, a frightful banker all spotted with smallpox, deigned to take a fancy to her. Alas, woman keeps on the watch for a protector as much as for a lover. Cats chase mice as well as birds. Two months ago that young woman was virtuous in an attic. She adjusted little brass rings in the eyelet holes of corsets. What do you call it? She sewed. She had a camp bed. She dwelt beside a pot of flowers. She was contented. Now here she is, a bankeress. This transformation took place last night. I met the victim this morning in high spirits. The hideous point about it is that the jade is as pretty today as she was yesterday. Her financier did not show in her face. Roses have this advantage or disadvantage over women, that the traces left upon them by caterpillars are visible. Ah, there is no morality on earth. I call to witness the myrtle, the symbol of love, the laurel, the symbol of air, the olive, that ninny, the symbol of peace, the apple tree, which came nearest wrangling Adam with its pips, and the fig tree, the grandfather of petticoats. As for right, do you know what right is? The Gauls covet Clusium, Rome protects Clusium, and demands what wrong Clusium has done to them. Brennus answers, the wrong that Alba did to you, the wrong that Fidene did to you, the wrong that the Iques, the Volsci, and the Sabines have done to you. They were your neighbors. The Clusians are ours. We understand neighborliness, just as you do. You have stolen Alba. We shall take Clusium, Rome said. You shall not take Clusium. Brennus took Rome. Then he cried, Ve Victus. That is what right is. Ah, what beasts of prey there are in this world. What eagles. It makes my flesh creep. He held out his glass to Jolie, who filled it. Then he drank and went on, having hardly been interrupted by this glass of wine, of which no one, not even himself, had taken any notice. 
Brennus who takes Rome is an eagle. The banker who takes the grisette is an eagle. There is no more modesty in the one case than in the other. So we believe in nothing. There is but one reality. Drink. Whatever your opinion may be in favor of the lean cock, like the canton of Uri, or in favor of the fat cock, like the canton of Glarus, it matters little. Drink. You talk to me of the boulevard, of that procession, etc., etc. Come now. Is there going to be another revolution? This poverty of means on the part of the good God astounds me. He has to keep greasing the groove of events every moment. There is a hitch. It won't work. Quick, a revolution. The good God has his hands perpetually black with that cart grease. If I were in his place, I'd be perfectly simple about it. I would not wind up my mechanism every minute. I'd lead the human race in a straightforward way. I'd weave matters mesh by mesh without breaking the thread. I would have no provisional arrangements. I would have no extraordinary repertory. What the rest of you call progress advances by means of two motors, men and events. But, sad to say, from time to time, the exceptional becomes necessary. The ordinary troop suffices neither for event nor for men. Among men, geniuses are required. Among events, revolutions. Great accidents are the law. The order of things cannot do without them. And, judging from the apparition of comets, one would be tempted to think that heaven itself finds actors needed for its performance. At the moment when one expects it the least, God placards a meteor on the wall of the firmament. Some queer star turns up, underlined by an enormous tail, and that causes the death of Caesar. Brutus deals him a blow with a knife, and God a blow with a comet. Crack! Behold an aurora borealis! Behold a revolution! Behold a great man! Ninety-three in big letters. Napoleon on guard. The comet of 1811 at the head of the poster. Ah, what a beautiful blue theater, all studded with unexpected flashes. Boom, boom. Extraordinary show. Raise your eyes, boobies. Everything is in disorder, the star as well as the drama. Good God, it is too much and not enough. These resources gathered from exception seem magnificence and poverty. My friends, providence has come down to expedience. What does a revolution prove? That God is in a quandary. He affects a coup d'etat because he, God, has not been able to make both ends meet. In fact, this confirms me in my conjectures as to Jehovah's fortune. And when I see so much distress in heaven and on earth, from the bird who has not a grain of millet to myself without a hundred thousand livres of income, when I see human destiny, which is very badly worn, and even royal destiny, which is threadbare, witness the Prince de Conde hung, when I see winter, which is nothing but a rent in the zenith through which the wind blows, when I see so many rags even in the perfectly new purple of the morning on the crests of the hills, when I see the drops of dew, those mock pearls, when I see the frost, that paste, when I see humanity ripped apart and events patched up, and so many spots on the sun, and so many holes in the moon, when I see so much misery everywhere, I suspect that God is not rich. The appearance exists, it is true, but I feel that he is hard up. He gives a revolution as a tradesman whose money box is empty gives a ball. God must not be judged from appearances. Beneath the gilding of heaven I perceive a poverty-stricken universe. Creation is bankrupt. That is why I am discontented. Here it is, the 4th of June. It is almost night. Ever since this morning I have been waiting for daylight to come. It has not come, and I bet that it won't come all day. This is the inexactness of an ill-paid clerk. Yes, everything is badly arranged. Nothing fits anything else. This old world is all warped. I take my stand on the opposition. Everything goes awry. The universe is a tease. It's like children. Those who want them have none, and those who don't want them have them. Total, I'm vexed.
Besides, Lagle de Mew, that bald head offends my sight. It humiliates me to think that I am of the same age as that baldy. However, I criticize, but I do not insult. The universe is what it is. I speak here without evil intent, and to ease my conscience. Receive, Eternal Father, the assurance of my distinguished consideration. Ah, by all the saints of Olympus, and by all the gods of paradise, I was not intended to be a Parisian. That is to say, to rebound forever, like a shuttlecock between two battle dores, from the group of the loungers to the group of the roisterers, I was made to be a Turk, watching Oriental Auris all day, executing those exquisite Egyptian dances, as sensuous as the dream of a chaste man, or a Beauceron peasant, or a Venetian gentleman surrounded by gentle women, or a petty German prince, furnishing the half of a foot soldier to the Germanic Confederation, and occupying his leisure with drying his breeches on his hedge, that is to say, his frontier. Those are the positions for which I was born. Yes, I have said a Turk, and I will not retract. I do not understand how people can habitually take Turks in bad part. Mohammed had his good points, respect for the inventor of Seraglios, with Oris and Paradises, with Odalisques. Let us not insult Mohammedism, the only religion which is ornamented with a hen roost. Now, I insist on a drink. The earth is a great piece of stupidity, and it appears that they are going to fight all those imbeciles, and to break each other's profiles, and to massacre each other in the heart of summer, in the month of June, when they might go off with a creature on their arm to breathe the immense heaps of new-mown hay in the meadows. Really, people do commit altogether too many follies. An old broken lantern, which I have just seen at a bric-a-brac merchant's, suggests a reflection to my mind. It is time to enlighten the human race. Yes, behold me sad again. That's what comes of swallowing an oyster and a revolution the wrong way. I am growing melancholy once more. Oh, frightful old world! People strive, turn each other out, prostitute themselves, kill each other, and get used to it. And Grantaire, after this fit of eloquence, had a fit of coughing, which was well earned. Apropos of revolution, said Joly, it is decidedly aberrant that Barius is in love. Does anyone know with whom? demanded Lagel. Do. No? Do, I tell you. Marius's love affairs, exclaimed Grantaire. I can imagine it. Marius is a fog, and he must have found a vapor. Marius is of the race of poets. He who says poet says fool, madman, Timbreus Apollo. Marius and his Marie, or his Marian, or his Maria, or his Mariette, they must make a queer pair of lovers. I know just what it is like, ecstasies in which they forget to kiss. Pure on earth, but joined in heaven, they are souls possessed of senses. They lie among the stars. Grantaire was attacking his second bottle, and possibly his second harangue, when a new personage emerged from the square aperture of the stairs. It was a boy less than ten years of age, ragged, very small, yellow, with an odd fizz, a vivacious eye, an enormous amount of hair, drenched with rain and wearing a contented air. The child, unhesitatingly making his choice among the three, addressed himself to Lagle de Mew. Are you Monsieur Bossuet? That is my nickname, replied Lagle. What do you want with me? This. A tall blonde fellow on the boulevard said to me, Do you know Mother Hucheloup? I said, Yes, Rue Chanvrerie. The old man's widow, he said to me. Go there. There you will find Monsieur Bossuet. Tell him from me, A, B, C. It's a joke that they're playing on you, isn't it? He gave me ten sous. Joli, lend me ten sous, said Lagle, and turning to Grantaire. Grantaire, lend me ten sous. This made twenty sous, which Lagle handed to the lad. Thank you, sir, said the urchin. 
What is your name? inquired Lagel. Nave, Gavroche's friend. Stay with us, said Lagel. Breakfast with us, said Grantaire. The child replied, I can't. I belong in the procession. I'm the one to shout, Down with Polignac. And executing a prolonged scrape of his foot behind him, which is the most respectful of all possible salutes, he took his departure. The child gone, Grantaire took the word. That is the purebred gammon. There are a great many varieties of the gammon species. The notary's gammon is called Skip the Gutter. The cook's gammon is called a scullion. The baker's gammon is called a mitron. The lackey's gammon is called a groom. The marine gammon is called the cabin boy. The soldier's gammon is called the drummer boy. The painter's gammon is called paint grinder. The tradesman's gammon is called an errand boy. The courtesan gammon is called the minion. The kingly gammon is called the dauphin. The god gammon is called the bambino. In the meantime, Lagel was engaged in reflection. He said half aloud, A, B, C, that is to say, the burial of Lamarck. The tall blonde, remarked Grantaire, is Enholras, who is sending you a warning. Shall we go? ejaculated Bossuet. It's Radig, said Joly. I have sworn to go through fire, but not through water. I don't want to get a cold. I shall stay here, said Grantaire. I prefer a breakfast to a hearse. Conclusion? We remain, said Lagel. Well then, let us drink. Besides, we might miss the funeral without missing the riot. Ah, the riot, I am with you, cried Joly. Lagel rubbed his hands. Now we're going to touch up the revolution of 1830. As a matter of fact, it doesn't hurt the people along the seams. I don't think much of your revolution, said Grantaire. I don't execrate this government. It is the crown tempered by the cotton nightcap. It is a scepter ending in an umbrella. In fact, I think that today, with the present weather, Louis Philippe might utilize his royalty in two directions. He might extend the tip of the scepter end against the people and open the umbrella end against heaven. The room was dark. Large clouds had just finished the extinction of daylight. There was no one in the wine shop or in the street, everyone having gone off to watch events. Is it midday or midnight? cried Bossuet. You can't see your hand before your face. Give a loat, fetch a light. Grantaire was drinking in a melancholy way. And Holras disdains me, he muttered. And Holras said, Joly is ill. Grantaire is drunk. It was to Bossuet that he sent Navet. If he had come for me, I would have followed him. So much the worse for Enholras. I won't go to his funeral. This resolution once arrived at, Bossuet, Joly, and Grantaire did not stir from the wine shop. By two o'clock in the afternoon, the table at which they sat was covered with empty bottles. Two candles were burning on it, one in a flat copper candlestick, which was perfectly green, the other in the neck of a cracked carafe. Grantaire had seduced Joly and Bossuet to wine. Bossuet and Joly had conducted Grantaire back towards cheerfulness. As for Grantaire, he had got beyond wine, that merely moderate inspirer of dreams, ever since midday. Wine enjoys only a conventional popularity with serious drinkers. There is, in fact, in the matter of inebriety, white magic and black magic. Wine is only white magic. Grantaire was a daring drinker of dreams. The blackness of a terrible fit of drunkenness, yawning before him, far from arresting him, attracted him. He had abandoned the bottle and taken to the beer glass. The beer glass is the abyss. Having neither opium nor hashish on hand, and being desirous of filling his brain with twilight, he had had recourse to that fearful mixture of brandy, stout, absinthe, which produces the most terrible of lethargies. It is of these three vapors, beer, brandy, and absinthe, that the lead of the soul is composed. They are three grooms, the celestial butterfly is drowned in them, and they are formed there in a membranous smoke, vaguely condensed into the wing of the bat. Three mute furies, 
nightmare, night, and death, which hover about the slumbering psyche. Grantaire had not yet reached that lamentable phase. Far from it. He was tremendously gay, and Bossuet and Jolie retorted. They clinked glasses. Grantaire added to the eccentric accentuation of words and ideas a peculiarity of gesture. He rested his left fist on his knee with dignity, his arm forming a right angle, and with cravat untied, seated astride a stool, his full glass in his right hand, he hurled solemn words at the big maidservant Maitelot. Let the doors of the palace be thrown open. Let every one be a member of the French Academy, and have the right to embrace Madame Hucheloup. Let us drink. And turning to Madame Hucheloup, he added, Woman, ancient and consecrated by use, draw near that I may contemplate thee. And Jolie exclaimed, Maitelot and Gibelot, don't give Gradtaire anything more to drink. He has already devoured since this boarding, in wild prodigality, two francs at ninety-five centimes. And Grantaire began again. Who has been unhooking the stars without my permission, and putting them on the table, in the guise of candles? Bossuet, though very drunk, preserved his equanimity. He was seated on the sill of the open window, wetting his back in the falling rain, and gazing at his two friends. All at once he heard a tumult behind him, hurried footsteps, cries of, To arms! He turned round and saw, in the Rue Saint-Denis, at the end of the Rue de la Chanverie, in Holras, passing, gun in hand, and Gavroche with his pistol, Fouilly with his sword, Courfeyrac with his sword, and Jean Prouvaire with his blunderbuss. Combeferre with his gun, Bajorel with his gun, and the whole armed and stormy rabble which was following them. The Rue de la Chanverie was not more than a gunshot long. Bossuet improvised a speaking trumpet from his two hands placed around his mouth and shouted, Courfeyrac, Courfeyrac, ho he! Courfeyrac heard the shout, caught sight of Bossuet, and advanced a few paces into the Rue de la Chanverie, shouting, What do you want? which crossed a, where are you going? To make a barricade, replied Corfirac. Well, here, this is a good place. Make it here. That's true, Egel, said Corfirac. And at a signal from Corfirac, the mob flung themselves into the Rue de la Chanverie. End of Book Twelve, Chapter Two